Idaho Falls, Idaho. Good. Go ahead. The cartoon shown a couple segments ago about the brain in the tank was presaged by John Hersey's book, The uh, Child Buyer, back in the 60s sometime. If you're familiar with that book, I'd like you to comment about it. And I'd like you also to comment about the chances of the folks who want to bring back the 8th century of actually succeeding. And I chose the 8th century because the uh, Battle of Tours was actually a pretty close-run thing. And I'd like to listen on the air, if you please. Thank you very much. Uh, I actually missed the beginning of your question, but I'll comment on the 8th century. Uh, I don't think uh, fundamentalist views, particularly ones that want to turn the clock back, are likely to succeed. Uh, our belief in progress in technology, in finding solutions to problems is pretty deeply rooted. And the world has actually moved very much in this direction. If you go back 50 years ago, there actually weren't that many uh, democracies. There weren't that many countries that practiced free enterprise. And so we've actually moved quite a bit, even though there are notable handout, uh, holdouts, uh, if you look at, at the sweep of human history. Uh, so I don't think that the clock is going to be turned back. I am concerned, though, about the potential for individuals who have uh, certain ideas to uh, translate those into, into destructive impact because of the uh, empowerment of the individual, both creatively and destructively. Um, I'm also concerned about fundamentalist humanism, people that uh, feel that humans should not be enhanced, uh, not 8th century, but take uh, you know, our current state. Uh, I think it's actually not an, a new idea. We've been enhancing humanity for, for a long time. As I mentioned, life expectancy was 25,000 years ago, 37, 200 years ago. Uh, so we've, you know, it's unnatural to take antibiotics. Why not? That's a natural course of things. You get a bacterial infection. Why not? Just, why intervene in an unnatural way? Well, so, uh, but there is this idea that we should not go beyond, quote, normal human ability. But what's normal? I mean, just look at the range of, quote, normal human ability in music or science or anything else. It's a vast range. And I think really going beyond our limitations, enhancing ourselves, is really the, the story of humanity. That's what we do uniquely, uh, and we should continue that. Uh, we see the same thing in, in terms of not changing biology at all, that uh, we shouldn't enhance biology. But, you know, caref we have to be mindful of dangers and downsides, and we have to test things uh, to make sure they're safe, but uh, going beyond the natural abilities of biology, whether it's in a tomato or a human, I think it's something that we do well. And biology is not perfect. It's very intricate. It's very clever. But as we actually learn how it works, we find that it's very suboptimal. Uh, there's a design, for example, for robotic red blood cells by Rob Friedis. Uh, analysis of those indicates if you replace 10 percent of your red blood cells with these robotic respirocytes, you could do an Olympic sprint for 15 minutes without taking a breath or sit at the bottom of your pool for four hours. But aside from those interesting things, it actually would be dramatically beneficial for your health, uh, would keep you going if your heart stopped, would better oxygenate your tissues. Uh, we can actually do a good job of extending uh, human biology uh, and biology in general as we learn uh, its secrets, reverse engineer it, simulate it, and then extend it by merging it with our technology. What companies are at the forefront of uh, your future as you see it? What companies should we be looking to, to as far as current experimentation going on? Well, I think an interesting phenomenon is that uh, individuals or very small teams uh, can do quite revolutionary work. Uh, we do a certain amount of mentoring and early stage investing, and I'm very impressed with the very exciting technology that comes from little teams, and there's just thousands of these entrepreneurs. And they're not just in Silicon Valley and Massachusetts, and they're cropping up in uh, the middle of the United States, in South America, in Africa, uh, Asia. I mean, uh, the internet now is everywhere, and the tools for creation are everywhere, and very creative people are, are making contributions. For example? Uh, well, just, I mean, a company that I recently got involved in uh, has created uh, some uh, um, molecules that actually control gene expression. 
because we're actually learning that uh, short RNA strands and other uh, molecules control whether genes are expressed or not expressed, whether they're enhanced or suppressed. And so you can take uh, these molecules and actually turn genes off or turn genes on. They have one product that uh, turns on the genes that create some super antioxidants, uh, super ox oxide demutase and catalase, which uh, are very are anti-aging molecules. So I mean, there's, there's a lot of interesting ways of reprogramming biology that are emerging from a lot of little companies. Uh, Microsoft and Google are, are very creative companies. Uh, they actually believe in fostering this kind of innovation from inside their, their companies. And Google has a well-publicized model of having actually all their people spend a, a fraction of their time just inventing on their own uh, so that ideas can bubble up. Uh, and Microsoft has a different approach to it, but it similarly uh, has a way of creating ideas from the sort of ferment of, of many individuals. We really have a uh, a period now where the individual is empowered with the tools to create very revolutionary ideas. And, and, and Google is a good example. I mean, there's two kids, students at Stanford, and they created a revolution in search engines. Uh, and the opportunity to do that is, uh, even in search engines, is becoming more and more uh, possible. Do you think that as we look to the future, Microsoft and Google will still be at the forefront of uh, what you see? Yeah, well, I think those companies will be successful 10 to 15 years from now. It's, it, it, it's very hard to predict individual companies. I mean, I can give you predictions about the course of uh, computation and communication. If you ask me the, you know, the cost of MIPS of computing in 2014, I can give you a figure, and it's likely to be accurate. Uh, I can just give you an educated guess when it comes to an individual company. But I, I know Microsoft and Google quite well, and the, the key competitive advantage they have is they have a very good way of attracting really creative and brilliant people. And ultimately that's, you know, it's not some lock on the market or some monopoly on something or some very clever technology. All of that will be worthless, you know, in a fairly short period of time. It's really the ability of the people there to keep reinventing uh, and be creative. And those, those two companies are, have uh, shown the ability to reinvent themselves. Uh, well, Google hasn't had to reinvent itself yet, but uh, although they've come up with some very creative new things beyond search, and of course Microsoft has reinvented itself already several times and is working on doing that again. So I, I have a lot of confidence in those two companies. For Ray Kurzweil, Dayton, Ohio. Of computer and aviation. I have gifted hundreds of, your, hundreds of your books, really five books, uh, to friends and uh, customers and love the book TV. I'm 58, a technologist. My name is Sue Haas and I'm founder, of, uh, founder and CEO of a software company and jet engine component business. Anyway, I have followed uh, your regime of nutrients from Fantastic Voyage for last 10 uh, months and have seen a tangible great results like high energy, creative, crisp use of mind and also my sweetheart is thrilled. However, I had I uh, followed Dr. Linus Pauling's uh, re regime several decades ago on vitamin C and found that it did not give me such pleasant results in the past. My question to you, sir, is, doctor, uh, is that do you have any concern or sense of potentially adverse impact of your daily regime? And also, do you have broader base, uh, good sample number of uh, your regime followers, and what is their consensus? Incidentally, I consider you a great gift to human rights. Well, thanks for your comments. Uh, my program, the program that Dr. Grossman and I devised, uh, is not one size fits all, and it's not, okay, do these five things and just follow it, and everybody should do the same thing, and, and, and that's it. Uh, the most important part of the program is actually, to quote the Bible, know thyself and learn about your own body. Uh, take take a lot of tests. We describe that in the book to find out, you know, how's your atherosclerosis going? How's your insulin resistance? Uh, how's your detoxification system? There's many different ways to measure this. Do you have early uh, detectable forms of cancer? And, and that, that's a fair amount of effort, but it really is worthwhile to, to know your own health situation. Many people, when they do this, discover they have some chronic conditions. Maybe they have metabolic syndrome. A third of the adult population 
has that as kind of precursor to type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, uh, that really speeds up aging uh, and can lead to full-blown diabetes and so on. So I, I can't describe all the issues. But it's important to really test yourself. And then as you adopt, you find out, well, maybe you're insulin resistant, so you take some supplements for that. You don't, you don't just adopt it and that's the end. You keep testing yourself, seeing if it actually works. Uh, see if, the, if there are adverse reactions, because pe sometimes people have reactions to certain supplements. So it, it, it's really a period of exploration. We give a lot of ideas in the book. Uh, originally, the publisher said, well, where's the sort of one-trick pony here? But then they actually got on our bandwagon and appreciated the fact that we give a lot of ideas, because our bodies are complex. We don't have some system yet that can just do it all for you. You have to learn about yourself and adopt a personalized program and keep tracking your own health. But if you do that, and armed with the kind of knowledge we provide in Fantastic Voyage, you really can dramatically slow down disease and aging processes. So that even people, I think you said you were 58, I'm 58, we uh, baby boomers can in 10, 15 years, when we have the full flowering of this biotechnology revolution, where we'll have very powerful tools to reprogram biology, can still be in good shape. So. Uh, you know, I'm delighted to hear that you've had a good experience. Uh, and, you know, keep, keep it up. Keep testing yourself. Keep, you know, keep assessing how, how are you reacting. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of my time uh, keeping abreast of new health information about new therapies or new research about old therapies or even information about my own body that I didn't realize before. It's a constant period of exploration and refinement. Will pharmacy companies move from medic, med, creating medicine to creating nanobots if that's the way that you see as far as the human body being re-engineered? Well, one, one trend that we will see is personalized medicine. We're learning, for example, cancer is very personalized. And this idea of just, okay, you get this kind of cancer, you take these chemotherapy drugs, is not a good approach. And we actually find that uh, certain chemotherapy drugs work very well for certain people and not for other people, and we need to figure that out before we give the treatment or actually create a treatment that's actually designed and works just for the antigens on your cancer cells. And those kinds of therapies are coming. And in fact, we're going to have to redesign FDA approval mechanisms because they're not well designed for this kind of personalized medicine. But that's actually a very powerful development. But yes, I mean, th there's already uh, lots of medical devices and systems where we put computerized devices in your body. You can swallow a, l a tiny little pill that actually takes all kinds of measurements and photographs as it goes through your digestive system and uh, bl Bluetooth that information to a little computer you carry in your belt and then disintegrates. Uh, and I mean, I can give you 20 other examples of where we have already, maybe not yet blood cell size devices, but tiny devices that are computerized and programmable. This implant, uh, this computer you can put inside your brain or replace the biological neurons destroyed by Parkinson's disease is programmable. You can download new software to the computer in your brain from outside the patient. So there's many exciting examples already. And as these devices get smaller, as I said, we're shrinking them by a factor of 100 per decade in 3D volume and more powerful, multiplying their power by 1,000 every decade, uh, that's going to become more and more